Hello friends, I'm Max and this video is an overview of my accomplished projects and bushcraft activities during the last summer vacation spent at my log cabin camp. During that month I improved the creek's dam, assembled a water wheel powered mill, made a bushcraft tool rack, fastened and tested a DIY clogger's knife, repaired the cabin's door that was broken by an intruder, established a small garden as well as milk, flour and coffee for more bushcraft culinary experiments. Because it would be impossible to publish a detailed video showing every project, this video will be an overview compilation. The primary project that I worked on during this 30 day stay was building a water wheel powered mill. I finally fulfilled my old dream to bake hearth bread using homegrown wheat dehusked and milled on the spot. As soon as I arrived to my log cabin camp and brought a few basic tools from the boat, I began to work on establishing a mini garden to grow lettuce, radish and other fast growing vegetables. I fenced the raised garden bed using bird cherry branches and filled it with sapropel, a dried organic sludge collected from the bottom of my pond that I mixed with leftover compost used at my tree nursery last season. This is some onion that receded itself from last year's crop. I didn't bring my fishing landing net this season, so I had to make one to collect the pond's sludge. To make a makeshift landing net, I used an old polymer bag and a spare kayak's rib bent from a fir branch. To prepare the polymer bag for assembly, I first pulled out some threads to make the fabric more water permeable. This primitive contraption helped me to clean the pond and to fertilize the vegetable bed all in one step. Now it is time to plant seeds. Knowing that I'm pretty far north, I use the fastest germinating vegetable seeds for risky agricultural zones. However, I only managed to grow a mediocre crop by the end of the stay as the summer was particularly cold that year. The night temperature dropped to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 8 degrees Celsius. Once done with the immediate task of seeding plants and clearing the passage to the lake shore, I continued to move tools and supplies from my boat to the cabin camp. In fact, I was doing it on and off for the rest of the week. As I approached the cabin, I noticed that my bear-proof door was challenged by a two-legged antagonist armed with a pry bar, as evidenced by these pry bar marks. The intruder only managed to partially break the door, as it was a bear-proof door after all. I can see how the door was damaged, but I can't understand why someone would want to break an unlocked door. Perhaps someone has an explanation. I am at my wit's end. In any case, I plan to take out the door from its frame to tighten the gap between the two slabs this season. When building the door, I knew the white slabs would fully dry in a year, which would result in a gap widening, even though I hammered the spline between the slabs. This is why I installed dowels only on one end of the door's dovetailed rails. In order to take my pin-hinged door out for repair, I had to lift the door frame's header along with the whole roof using a post and two wedges. This roof lifting procedure is not complicated. I've done it more than once when installing the door. I even kept the original wedges. Unexpectedly, the next step was more time consuming. It took me about 20 minutes to hammer out the rails dowels. The dovetailed door rails came out easier. The intruder most likely came here in a snowmobile and had some tools with them. Since then, there was enough time for temperate slabs to slightly warp, which means I will need to correct the door's geometry, a repair I didn't count on doing. Luckily, I had my giant two-hand chisel with me. It is a perfect tool to shave, cut and even smooth large surfaces if you don't have a hand plane with you. Once done with correcting the dovetailed joints geometry, I joined the door's surfaces using a scrap plane, a present from my friend Alex Siegfried. Alex, thank you for such an excellent German tool. 
then I inserted a new spline into the grooves between the slabs, assembled the door and hammered in two dowels into each horizontal rail. Lastly, we need to install a door handle. I made the handle's metal part from an old railroad spike in advance back home. Making the door handle is a very basic blacksmithing project, while the final result looks quite advanced. As long as you have a place to heat up a railroad spike, you can easily make such twisted door handle that has an illusion of a fancy design. I foresee a question about its ergonomics. Even though my door is quite heavy, the handle's twisted edges don't cause any discomfort during its use. To make the handle go along with the cabin's rustic design, I made the rest of it from curvy pine branches. Before fully installing the handle, I smoothened the door's surfaces with a hand plane to complete the restoration procedure. I'm also planning to finish it with oil, so it won't look much lighter than the aged cabin's logs. Because I'm right-handed, I decided to install the handle slightly counterclockwise for better ergonomics. Now, with the new handle in place, the door carrying task has become much easier. In order to install the door back, all you have to do is insert the pin hinges into the round mortises and hammer out the wedge. The header will drop back under the roof's weight, securing the door's upper pin hinge. When I installed the door and published the video about it, some people warned me that the pins will wear off fast. However, after using it for two years, I haven't noticed any wear on the wooden hinges at all. It looks like the handle fits the surrounding style. I'm also thinking about making a metal or wooden latch for the door as a functional decoration. I would appreciate getting any design ideas from you guys, as I couldn't decide on its style for quite some time. Lastly, I finished the door with an end grain wax finish mostly for looks, as the roof's extra long overhang provides a good rain and snow protection. I hope that next time nobody will try to break in through my unlocked door with a crowbar, but rather just use handle as a courtesy instead. After about a week, after the door was finished with oil, it got noticeably darker and no longer stood out against the old logs. Meanwhile, I have to get ready for my main project of this season, the water wheel powered mill. I prefer to start such large projects with time consuming meticulous preparation. It will require making special tools, jigs and setting up a workspace. I made a wooden mallet and rebuilt an old workbench. Once I roughly shaped its head with a chainsaw, I decided to use my homemade clogger's knife. The huge knife requires a base with a properly attached pin to operate. I haven't made a dedicated base yet and to save time I decided to install it on my shaving horse for now. To do that I installed the metal pin on the side of the shaving horse. The pivoting knife has a hole that is coupled with a metal pin fixed to the shaving horse. This is not a traditional solution but I decided to make it like this anyway. Usually, a clogger's knife is attached to a base through its upper reach extension that is shaped as a hook. The clogger's knife topic is pretty broad and interesting. If there is enough interest from my viewers, I will make a separate video about it. Note, the knife's pin attachment will not interfere if the shaving horse is used as a vise. I used the draw knife to shape my mallet's head just to prove that point. The scrap plane actually works faster and cleaner for such tasks. As for shaping or cleaning the mallet head's face, the clogger's knife is a perfect tool. It literally takes a minute to clean up a smashed or chipped mallet's face using it. Lastly, I shaped a slightly tapered maple handle so that its one end is slightly thicker than the mallet's head's eye. Note, 
the handles thicker and shouldn't be cylindrical, but rather oval, so that it spreads the head cylindrical eye along the grain. If the handle is wedged across the mallet's head's grain, it will just split it. As a last step, I drilled a one and a quarter inch 32 mm head's eye and assembled the mallet. Now I have a much needed tool that you will soon see in use in my upcoming projects, such as making a topsy-turvy workbench, building a water wheel, making a bushcraft tool rack, building a primitive lathe from a log and more. And a few words about restoring and modifying my workbench made from a falling tree that I used as both a lathe and a workbench to make most parts of my water wheel. You might remember I milled three long slabs from this falling pine and then used it as a workbench under a canopy. Even though I protected this improvised workbench against rain, it dried out and slightly warped over the years. It is time to straighten its surface. I didn't have a jointer plane, which would be an ideal tool for the task, so I used my trusty scrap plane to flatten the workbench's surface as much as I could. You might have noticed a bunch of round openings on the workbench's top and sides. They significantly expanded the workbench's functionality. Some of the openings were used as bench dog holding holes, while others were used as a part of an improvised lathe. I used the modified workbench to make most of the parts for my water wheel project. This lathe looking contraption was necessary to make precise axial holes in my water wheel's shaft to prevent the shaft's deflection, run out and vibration. By manually rotating the massive octagonal shaft on the improvised lathe, I drilled two perfectly centered axial holes. This water wheel project was a case that proved thorough preparation pays off. It was later quite easy to properly install the water wheel on a dam with no shaft run out or vibration. This is the preliminary story about my summer projects that I organized chronologically as most of them are interconnected. You can suggest what project you would like to see in more detail in the next episode. This is Maxi Gorov from St. Petersburg, Russia. If you liked this video, perhaps you could share it with your friends. Let good people watch good videos. P.S. I only produce one or two videos max a month and if you don't want to miss new content like this, Subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Due to new YouTube's recommendation algorithm, its notifications have become more unstable otherwise. PPS. Below I left a link to my DIY projects playlist, as well as playlists about my log cabin building, bushcraft projects, kayaks making and outdoor cooking. I hope to see you back on Advoco Makes.